So the United States has been a nation of contradictions. A nation built by immigrants whose president now tries to close its gate. A nation that has been as passionate for slavery as it has been for equality. It's a nation of Republicans and Democrats, of immigrants and native, truth and propaganda, slave and free. In a nation with such contradictions, is it even possible to find a common identity? And what should that common identity be based on? These questions and more we'll try to answer today with our amazing guest, Jill Lepore. She's a Harvard professor, a journalist, and a writer, so she'll have a lot to say on these questions. Last year, she published her book, These Truths. We also have it on our stage right now. It's very thick, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very thick book. In this book, it is a co it's a comprehensive history of America. Mm. However, she also questions these self-evident and unalienable rights set out by the Founding Fathers. Life, equality, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yeah, so besides historical and national identities, we'll also touch upon polarization. So the past was also polarized. Can we learn from the past as to how to move away from this polarized state we're living in right now? And also the power of history. Where does it begin and where does it end? Mm -hmm. Of course, as usual, we will have time for audience questions. Mm -hmm. So if you just raise your hand, our audience, uh, our mic guy, Nino, will come and rush to your aid. But for now, please give a warm round of applause for Professor Lepore. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, the couches are a bit deep, but oh hopefully goodness. they're comfortable. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm just sit up here to be serious. <laughs> yeah. So, welcome, Professor Lepore. Thank you. Um, Thanks so much. Welcome in Europe. <laughs> we were wondering why should we, as Europeans, care about American history? Mm. Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> I think that um, the United States is going through a huge transition right now that affects domestic affairs, but also is very much, as we can see in the daily news, affecting. And what kind of transition? Uh, it's affecting the whole world. Um, we're in the middle of a con what we would call a constitutional crisis. Uh, how the government is answerable to the people is hard to say right now. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of instability domestically, but it's also affecting US foreign yeah. policy. I mean, in response to all of you know, the, the situation America is in right now, you also, also wrote this book. However, you said that you wrote it for the average citizen as opposed to for scholars. Why, why, was, that your, why was that your choice? Because I think we, very, we live in a time of kind of uh, compressed information where mm -hmm. we have a great deal of information, but it's incredibly superficial. So we know a lot about what's going on right now. The, mm -hmm. You know, the notification you're getting on your phone about what the latest news headline is. is it, it is an enormous amount of information, mm -hmm. but there's very little depth. And it's very hard to see, it's, it's hard to actually stop looking at the day-to-day, minute-by-minute news and get a sense of where things came from. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to offer up to just the ordinary reader, a very, it's a deliberately long book. Like I, <laughs> I could have written a much shorter book, but I decided to write a long because I actually think there's something to be said for slowing down, trying to understand a mm -hmm. centuries-long history and then going back and reading the news headlines, and I think they make a little bit more sense, or maybe they're more troubling, but that you need that vantage. And how do you think that's going to happen? Because as you said, these headlines and the news right now is very quick, very accessible, you can catch up in, in 10 minutes. So how do you think people will actually grab this 900-page book and get that extra depth? You know, it's kind of amazing. The book was published in the US last year, so mm -hmm. a, a full year ago, and... Uh, I heard from a lot of, I get a lot of email from yeah. readers, and a lot of people said, well, I, I knew I was never going to carry that around. I got the <laughs> Kindle edition, I yeah. you know, got the e-book, yeah. or I got the audio book. I read the audio, it's me. And then they say, but I started listening, or I started, you know, Kindling, and then I realized I really wanted the physical book. Which is weird. It was kind of nice for me because it means they bought the book twice. Then like, <laughs> they go to the bookstore because they're like, I just really wanted to hold it in my hands and realize like I, because they found that they were going through the whole thing yeah. and they thought they were just going to skim. So they wanted something that was easy to just, just swipe through yeah. Yeah. or listen at double speed or all the things you do to accelerate how you might receive a big long book. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, no, actually I started reading. I realized I really wanted to turn the page. So I don't know, I think there, it's not just me. Like I think there's a real hunger for 
Yeah. You know, it's like if you, it, it's not a novel, but like if you fall into a novel, you really want to read every page of the novel. Like you actually yeah. want to find out what every character's arc, go, where it all goes. And it's, it's written that way and people weirdly do actually receive it that yeah. way. And you've received a lot of like powerful messages back from people as well. And my question to you is how did that actually make you feel? You know, um, I'm, I'm really glad I wrote the book. It was a hard thing to decide to do. It was a pain in the neck to write. <laughs> <laughs> it was not. How long you know, did it take you? You have like a 30-page essay to yeah. write or something. It can be a drag. But this was like, I knew it was going to take a long time. It took like three years. Oh, okay. It wasn't, you know, because um, I've been teaching this stuff for a long mm -hmm. time. It was not that hard to write. But um, the very first day it came out, I got an email from a woman who, like I was at a book party, like celebrating the book, and I like, you know, went into the bathroom, you know how like you always check your email in the bathroom? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I was and there was an email from a woman who said she'd pre-ordered the book on Amazon, and she would got it that morning, had sat down and like got read the, the whole day, and she, and she said, you know, I've just been feeling such despair about the state of the world, and you know, things like the U.S. pulling out of the Paris Climate Accords, or these things that just make you can make you really deeply yeah. despairing. And she said, I just, it's the first time in a long time I felt like I loved my country and I wanted to thank you for it. Like it was an incredibly moving email to get. So it made me feel like it was, it had been worth doing. Um, I mean, it didn't inspire some blind patriotism, but it did, it did make someone feel that they understood what was going on. And that was the whole point. So yeah, I feel good about having done it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you see this as your, duty as a historian to make the American history accessible to the entire country? I do in the sense that, like, I had been asked a lot of times over my career if I would write a textbook mm -hmm. or, do, you know, do some version of this. Mm -hmm. And I always said no because, like, it's a drag. <laughs> it's <so hard. laughs> like a textbook version mm -hmm. in particular, is, it's not much fun to write and... This is more of a civics book. This is more yeah. of a civics book. And I always said no because I also was like I had so many other things I wanted to write. And I got to a point right around when I was asked to do this where I thought like, you know what, it's the I should do it. Like it w as a sort of civic obligation. Like if as, a, as an American historian or as an American who is an American historian, if I were an American who wrote medieval French history, I wouldn't feel the obligation to write a book for the public. I don't know how, I mean, not that medieval French history isn't fascinating, <laughs> but I wouldn't feel a civic obligation to produce for yeah. Americans a book about medieval France. Whereas, but I am an American historian and I just felt like this, there'd been such incredible research in the academy about, that really expanded what we knew about American history that put the, the history of slavery and race and indigenous peoples and their struggles and women at the center of the story. And it somehow hadn't gotten outside of, you know, halls like this to the public. Mm -hmm. So I felt that it was important to do. Yeah, so you were talking about, for example, women and minorities and how you wanted to add this into your history. But even though this book is pretty thick, of course you cannot put everything of American history into one book. So we were wondering if you could walk us through a bit your decision-making process of deciding what to include and what not to include. Yeah. Mm. So mm. I kind of think of it like, um, like if you have a clothesline and you have a pile of laundry, <laughs> but you only have so much clothesline. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like you have to pick out like, okay, I'm going to only put shirts over here. <laughs> Or like, yeah. and this is only going to be pants. Like, and then the other stuff, I'm just <laughs> it's so what just did you choose? Shirts or pants? Like, <laughs> like what I <laughs> how I decided was um, mm. there were certain elemental themes that um, were going to be the clothesline itself, right? So um, the ideas that are necessary for a people to govern themselves. Where did those ideas come from? And then how do those ideas change over time? It's kind of maybe the main, like, that's the title too, right? These truths that we, we have the right to consent to our own government. So following the history of those political ideas over time was the main kind of clothesline. Mm -hmm. And then um, there's a lot in there about the history of technology, technologies of communications. Um, and then I would say there's actually quite a bit about the history of religion in the book. Um, yeah, and then the, the larger story of a struggle for political equality, meaning, you know, across racial difference and gender difference and uh, 
those probably are the three, three or four most important themes. So there's plenty of other stuff that like kind of belongs in the book, but you can't. Yeah. You have to make sense of the story. It's not your reader's obligation to make sense. Like you have to make sense of it. So, yeah. so figuring out what you know what to hang up on the line. That is the main work of the book, really. And you've faced quite a bit of critique actually for not including that much of an indigenous history. Do you agree with this criticism? Uh, Yes and no. Yeah. For one thing, the paperback has way more of that than mm -hmm. the original hardcover edition did. Yeah. Um, so to the degree that I do agree with that, I actually attended to it. I, ma I made a revision pass before the paperback mm -hmm. came out. So there's quite a bit more of that. Um, I do think to some degree that that's a, f that's a fair criticism. I started out studying indigenous history and the politics of um, conquest. So I know that scholarship. Uh, I think I didn't set out to write an indigenous history yeah. of the United States. It's, it's, it was not a main theme. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, think, it's, I think that... Um, would you change it if you could go back in time? Would you change it more now? I think the changes that I felt were necessary I have already yeah. made in the in paperback. The yeah. um, I think the... I don't read reviews of my own work, so I'm not really, fam honestly, too familiar with what the criticism is, just <laughs> I've kind of heard about it. Um, I think the criticism is that indigenous peoples fall out of the story after about 1890. Yeah. And um, so what I did in revision for the paperback was spend a lot more time thinking about the struggle for native nationhood in the, over the course of the 20th century uh, and insert you know, signal moments in the history of that struggle into the revision. So I actually, I think that, to me, that, that was a reasonable criticism and it's one that I addressed. Okay. I mean, you also wrote Case for the Nation, and in that book, um, you lay out, you already touched upon this a bit, but you lay out that not writing a national history um, creates a lot of problems, and, but not as many problems as, as writing a national history. Could you explain to us the difference between those problems? Yeah, so American historians used to write these sweeping histories yeah. of the American <laughs> experiment until the 1960s, mm -hmm. and when um, different groups in the United States really criticized those histories and said, look, your histories like leave out slavery and segregation and the struggle for civil rights, they leave out indigenous peoples and the struggle for native nationhood, they don't have any women in them, Th you know, there's a kind of a whole LBGTQ critique of the, those national histories. And they're just propping up some crazy vision of American triumphalism. And all of those criticisms were accurate. They were totally fair. And so younger historians just said, well, then the solution is to just not write national history because yeah. it's bad for the world. It's, ex yeah. it's more exclusive. Yeah, yeah. that it just it perpetuates all these myths. Uh, and it does a kind of violence of erasing people from the nation's past. And I, th that, I think I t understand that decision absolutely. But what happens in a nation that needs a story about its own past is that someone will offer up that story. And what happens when serious scholars don't do that work is that kind of demagogues and frauds and charlatans offer up those stories and then they beat nationalist drums and they offer up a, a history of the nation that's just completely a myth and, uh, and politically volatile and explosive. Could you give an example of something like that as we're seeing right now? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the nationalism behind, in the United States, the Tea Party movement, which mm -hmm. was a kind of resurrection of a myth of America for the sake of arguing. The Tea Party really emerged to try to defeat national health care by arguing that it was inconsistent with the founding fathers. And that's th that we needed to go back to the 18th century and have a new Tea Party and cast off the oppression of the federal government, which was oppressing Americans with national health care. Um, that, as a matter of historical argument, is crazy to me. Um, it's also... Could you explain why it's crazy to me? Why you? it's crazy to me? <laughs> Just its understanding of the 18th century and the dynamics of the 18th century yeah. and the... the uh, dynamics of the founding is just based on historical misinterpretation. That's it. It's, n it's not crazy to oppose national health care. That's like a position yeah. you can have and defend. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can defend it with George Washington didn't want us to have national yeah. health care. <laughs> you can defend it because you don't think it's a good federal policy. That's fine. We can argue about that. 
But you can't say, like, there's this dead saint who mm -hmm. I know what he says, and he tells me we can't have this. That, that's the crazy to me. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's the kind of thing that I think happens when academic historians aren't offering to the public the kind of serious, informed work that they should be offering. You can debate. Don't, don't have to agree with my account. But someone could write a different yeah. account. But there really hasn't been a book like this in the United States for a long time. So in the coming section, we want to talk a bit, a bit more about these different forms of national identities that if a nation decides to write one, uh, it can have. So um, civic patriotism, illiberal nationalism, liberal nationalism, and identity politics. And don't worry if this sounds scary now. We're all going to explain it <laughs> for Jill and delve into it. So starting on the, the first question we have about this. So we already touched upon the fact that America is an incredibly diverse nation, and it seems almost impossible to unite them. So what can a common American national identity be built upon? So I think the best way to understand a national identity for the United States is that it is based on a set of political ideas and political commitments. That, mm -hmm. you know, other countries have nationalisms that uh, are informed by a shared history or a shared language, a shared ethnicity, sh a shared struggle. The United States doesn't really have that, and nor really do most nations anymore. I mean, there was a time when that was what a nation was, but in the modern world, most nations are much, uh, are just much more diverse, uh, ethnically, linguistically. So the United States at its best has, has embraced you know, the, the idea of political equality as the founding notion of the country, um, the idea of a liberal democracy, and the idea that anyone who subscribes to that idea can be an American. Like That's actually why the United States was founded as a kind of asylum for people who were oppressed in other countries who could come to the United States. So long as they believed in, in this notion of a liberal democracy, they could be an American. And um, that's under siege, that idea. But I think it. I th I think it's still an incredibly powerful idea. And is this what you call civic patriotism in your book? This I kind of idea? Yeah. I mean, uh, to some degree, yeah. I mean, I think mm -hmm. sometimes people talk about that almost as a civic religion, yeah. uh, like a, a creed. Like, it, what do you believe? I, we believe that people should govern themselves. Like, that's a. Does that distinguish Americans from a lot of other people in the world? No. <laughs> but at the time of the founding of the country, it did, uh, and it's in it. And it remains the, the founding creed. Okay. I mean, you promote, you are very much in favor for civic patriotism, right? Don't, if, if, if something is wrong, do correct us, though. Um, however, civic patriotism right now, in, you know, in the times of Trump, is not as popular, or is not as widespread as illiberal nationalism. Mm -hmm. Why do you think illiberal nationalism keeps on getting the upper hand? <sighs> I don't know. Do you have an answer to that? <laughs> you have a theory. <laughs> you sound like you have a theory. Do I? Well, I well, have a theory. If you have a theory, that yeah. would be great if you could provide <laughs> it to us. <laughs> I'm only a student. You're a <laughs> professor. Uh, you know, the two, the two kinds of nationalism have been part of the American yeah. story from the start. Um, liberal nationalism is hard to, to contain because it is essentially a kind of universalism. Mm -hmm. So it always, because to say like, I believe that all people should govern themselves. Well, that's a universal claim. And that can take you in two directions. Like, well, then what are the boundaries of the nation? There are none. But it also can take you towards imperialism, right? Like, we, well, then we'll just take over other countries and tell them to believe this, right? So it, it can very quickly, it, it just kind of spreads out like jello. Like, it yeah. <laughs> it's not like, whereas, Illiberal nationalism, which is the idea that you know this country is, is a race-based mm -hmm. nationalism, it's a much simpler idea. And um, it's always in competition with liberal okay. nationalism. Why it, um, it is the idea that is on the rise in the United States, of course, in much of Europe as well. Um, a notion of a race-based yeah. nationalism that cherishes, you know, the defense of borders, that, uh, that cultivates a hatred for other peoples, right? It's not a love for your own country, it's actually a hatred for other people's yeah. countries. Uh, it's on the rise for all kinds of reasons, but I think among them is the failure of liberal nationalists to defend the idea of the nation. And the reason I think the nation is important to defend even though th there's always a risk that moves into nationalism of the, of the uglier sort, is that there really is no other institution in the history of human civilization 
that successfully grants and guarantees rights to human beings. So unless we have some other institutions that can guarantee rights, nations are what we have. So we have to figure out a way to talk about them and defend them on liberal grounds against uh, a li an illiberal version of nationalism. So you said that this failed, right? That the liberals failed to defend the nation in a good way. So what did they do wrong and what could they improve to defend this liberal idea of the nation better? Well, I wonder what the version of that failure is here or whether you think there is a failure here in that regard. Um, but in the United States, I think that um, there are a couple of explanations. One is, especially by the 1980s, many liberals came to believe that the nation state was essentially on the wane, that there really wouldn't be nation states going into the 21st century, that we would have, that our global ties, our kind of cosmopolitan global ties would, uh, would render obsolete fidelity to the nation, that we would have this kind of, you know, UN sort of um, universal human rights regime, uh, you know, like a, a version of the dream of the EU, yeah. right? Um, that Americans, il American liberal thinkers thought, oh, the United States will be moving in this kind of direction. Uh, and then, you know, there were a lot of predictions about the end of nationalism in the 80s. And then in the 90s, there was Bosnia and Rwanda, and people thought, oh, I guess we were wrong. <laughs> nationalism isn't dead. Nationalism <laughs> just keeps coming, you know, this kind of race-based nationalism, yeah. ethnic nationalism yeah. keeps Very coming back. Right. It keeps yeah. coming back. Um, and globalism, you know, this kind of in new internationalism, there's a lot of it, you know, that we have global markets and we have global forms mm -hmm. of communication and transportation and accelerated transportation and communication, huge transformations. But the work of kind of cultivating a liberal idea of the nation, it doesn't seem, I think it didn't seem necessary to the people who would have done that work for a long time. So it's not that they tried to do it and did it badly, it's that they stopped trying. Okay. I think, um, I mean, si let's just to go back to your idea of civic patriotism. Civic patriotism is based on the beliefs of the founding fathers. However, do you think that, you know, the founding, I mean, the founding fathers set out for equality, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And, um, but however, I America was not equal at its foundings either. And the tensions are still pretty high. Don't you think that this is too idealistic at the moment? Yeah, so I would dis disagree with uh, yeah. how you stated the question. Okay, how would you? Um, <laughs> how would I you actually, I don't like the founding fathers. I don't even yeah. like the phrase. Like, they're okay. not my founding fathers. Well, what, what like, I don't, I don't even get that. Like, that, the kind of, like, filial piety, the kind of worship of these great men of the 18th century, mm -hmm. I don't subscribe to that Okay, it's too saintly, all. yeah. Um, I do think that the idea, 18th century ideas, ideas of the 18th century Enlightenment remain important. Mm -hmm. And they are no less important for their many failures, right? That, that it's actually the long struggle. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, this but still, people are quite passionate about what, what they have said, and they constantly use the, the founding fathers as, as this religion, nearly, as you nearly said. Right, as you said. right. So, so I don't, though. Okay. I, don't, I don't buy that at all, honestly. Okay. Um, I think it's an incredibly narrow understanding mm -hmm. of even the 18th century. So... You know, in this book, when I talk about that era, the sort of 1770s and 1780s, I spend a lot of time talking about Benjamin Franklin's sister Jane, uh, or George Washington's liveryman, uh, a man named Harry Washington, who was born in Gambia, and who later f fled Washington's mansion and became a free man, uh, and ended up going to Canada and then eventually to Africa. Like, I spend a lot of time talking about, or James Madison's, uh, former slave, a man named William Gardner. Like, I spent a lot of time talking about people who are not those founding fathers, whose lives were made significantly worse in many ways by decisions that these founding fathers made. Uh, so, n no, I have a much more expansive notion okay. of what it is about that era we should pay attention to. It's, in fact, trying to dismantle that worship of the founding fathers that I think is necessary in order to move forward. There was a great time uh, in... 1987 was the 200th anniversary of our Constitution, and there was a whole lot of celebration of it. 
And Thurgood Marshall, who was the first African American to serve on our Supreme Court, mm -hmm. gave a speech where someone said, like, are you going to participate in the bicentennial, the cel 200th celebration of the Constitution? And he said, you know, no, <laughs> I'm not. Like, he's not a person who didn't yeah. care about the Constitution. He just said, you know, I'm going to celebrate the 200 years since. Like, I, I don't, even the document itself, like, it instantiated and, and sanctioned slavery. Like, I'm not going to celebrate the Constitution. I'm going to celebrate the struggle to live up to the idea, the promise of the Constitution. Okay. And, and that's how I feel about that. Just to say okay. it's quite important to study the Constitution um, and to study the founding moment in American history, uh, but in order to have a kind of critical sense of what its shortcomings were and how those struggles have proceeded in the years since. Okay, I think just to, just before we move on to the audience, just to round up the section also a little bit, uh, we talked about civic patriotism and how that's what you promote, however it's less popular. How would you, as a historian, how would you, you know, what is your capacity to promote civic patriotism and how would you? Historians are really not the best policy makers. <laughs> I think are probably our prime minister is, a, is a historian. Is that right? Yeah. I'm not. Gen I mean, I, it used to be that you had to study history to have a position in any government. Right? Mm -hmm. It was considered essential. Um, I'm not sure that I can think of a way to implement. A, and I don't have an ideological agenda, whereas most politicians have an ideological agenda. Okay. Um, I do. Would think anyone be able to implement civic patriotism? I don't know that it's a thing that you can, you know, it's not some top-down thing. I, okay. I, I mean, there, there's a kind of cultural change that needs to happen in the United States <coughs> if for the nation to survive, mm -hmm. really. So, um, I mean, as a, in, a, in a form that is recognizable to its own history. Um, I, I think, I actually think a lot of people would like to see the country have a better sense of itself. Uh, but I think that's the kind of thing that has to happen, you know, in public libraries and in schoolrooms and a lot of other places. It's not like some Harvard professor can swan in and <laughs> say, here's what I think. I just, <laughs> like, I don't think that works. Okay. So it's more supporting public education and civics classes and these kind of things that will back, bring back the love of democracy in America. You know, Not you. There's, <laughs> a, there's a national commission working right now on a mm -hmm. list of things that need to be done to save American democracy. There are a lot of people out there trying to figure out how to save democracy. And the there's a long list of things th that are proposed and some are being implemented. You know, they include things like um, a national service requirement for young people. Um, you know, it could be military, but more likely civic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, teaching positions or working for the government to build some sense of belonging to the country as a country. So there's a lot of stuff like that um, going on that it's, y we could talk about that long list of things. I think some of them are likely to work, um, but it's a pretty big task. Okay, so we thought that the audience now might have some questions. Not all at once. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a question over there. Thank you for coming. Um, so there's a lot of discussion, I'm an American, and there's a lot of discussion in our country about like the historical aspect of the Second Amendment, and there's a lot of, but it's kind of turned from more modern terms. What would be more, if, what would you say to those people that say that the Second Amendment should be very widely applied, mm -hmm. and what would you say was the actual historical sort of uh, basis for that? Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Um, the Second Amendment uh, concerns ownership of um, arms, firearms. Uh, I've written a long article about that called Battleground America on the long history of the Second Amendment and the debate over the Second Amendment. Quite a bit of that is in the book. But so I, I could spend an hour answering that question. It's a really important question. But I'm just going to give you a little historical context on it. Um, the Second Amendment, until 1965, was known as the Lost Amendment because no one ever quoted it or cited it. It just had no bearing uh, on American political discourse. So the regulation, safety regulation of guns is, has been present throughout American history. Uh, in the West, you, know, you think about these Western movies. In the West, if you entered a city in the West, you had to turn in your gun at the sheriff's office to be in town. Um, this is a long history of gun regulation of one kind or another. 
Uh, it was an incredibly you know, powerful history of gun ownership, private gun ownership, for all kinds of reasons. Um, in the 1930s, the federal government passed its first firearms legislation, because these, these were all state and municipal laws. In the 1930s, the Federal Firearms Act and the National Firearms Act were passed in 1934 and 1938. They banned, for instance, machine guns. Like, if you think of gangsters in the 1930s, machine guns were banned in those forms of legislation. And, and the NRA, the National Rifle Association, supported those efforts. Um, so there's a lot of, and the, although those two laws were appealed on the basis that they uh, conflicted with the Second Amendment, the Supreme Court in 1939, in a unanimous nine to zero decision, said that they didn't. Like, the Second Amendment doesn't mean you can't, the gov federal government doesn't have a right to have gun safety laws, to pass gun safety laws. Um, it's not until the 1960s that, this, that it even became an issue. And then uh, it became an issue after John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And there was an attempt in 1968 to pass a new federal gun legislation that had to do with not being able to buy guns from magazines. Uh, that is to say, you know, from print magazines. Uh, and um, that, led to, that was a time when American politics was becoming really divisive uh, after 1968. And as American politics polarized, uh, a gun rights movement emerged in the 1970s that was associated with a rising conservative movement. And um, it's a sort of the analog to to um, the abortion rights movement on the left. In those two issues, guns and abortion, are largely responsible in many ways for polarizing the American electorate. In the sense, and they ha they're, co they're quite similar in that they rest on kind of weak constitutional arguments and they're highly emotional. And so how American politics polarized, I'm answering this question at length because you guys I know want to talk about polarization. Uh, in the 70s and 80s really was um, the left and the right getting out the vote by convincing people that these were rights that had been taken away from them. Um, and so if you think about guns and, guns and abortion, if you make like a grid, and like on the y-axis you have guns and abortion, and on the x-axis you have murder and freedom, um, that's just kind of how the politics spelled out. So if you were on the, on the far right, guns were freedom and abortion was murder, but if you're on the far left, abortion was, was freedom and guns were murder. And this was a way to get people to go vote because there are ex explosive emotional issues uh, where a lot for many people, there are life and death issues for many people, a lot is on the line. Um, but that is still the case, right? That is still the yeah. case, yeah. So it's just a, it's, there's a lot of political, like I think very naked and ugly political opportunism um, there. What the, is for, as a historian, what the Second Amendment says has nothing to do with what's going on with guns. Uh, nothing to do with what's, I don't think, by my reading of the Second Amendment and the history of its understanding over the course of American history, yes, people do have a right to bear arms, clearly, but the government, that doesn't mean the government doesn't have uh, the, the power to regulate um, guns for purposes of public safety and public health. Do you think people have been misreading the Second Amendment on purpose to really use history, I guess, to further their case? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's plenty of people who earnestly believe what they believe, but then there's plenty of people who are making piles of money by convincing people to believe what they want them to believe. That's how politics works. Mm. Are there any more audience questions? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, so I was wondering, you were writing the book and then Trump happened. And to a lot of people, it did feel like that, like Trump just happened. <laughs> so I'm wondering <laughs> Sorry. whether it was the same to you. The, w you were writing this book and did Trump fit in there naturally? Or did you have to change anything in the structure or what you're including or excluding in order to build up for the Trump era? Yeah, thank you for that question. So the book starts in 1492. And when I first planned it out, it was going to end in 2009 with Barack Obama's inauguration. Mm -hmm. Because that was a great ending. Like just, it's, <laughs> a, it's, a, it's a dramatic scene. Uh, the inauguration day of Barack Obama's inauguration was incredibly festive. It, 
it addresses a lot of the wrongs of American history or appeared to us. So I, I was very happy with my structure. And then us well past halfway through the book, Trump was elected in, in November of 2016, and I realized it was such a, a realigning election that I had to add like a chapter. <laughs> like I was going to have to end not in 2009, but suddenly in 2016, um, and it was going to be a very different ending. And, but it would be unfair to people that, you know, supported Trump and got him elected to just ignore that. I mean, it was a really important um, political revolution. It's a big orange elephant in the, in the room. Yeah, so, so, I had to <laughs> so I had to end there. Um, but then, it is the same book, do you know what I mean? But pe I had this weird thing where people would say to me, I just read your book and explained everything about Trump to me, and I'd be like, how? <laughs> because I didn't know Trump was gonna be elected when I wrote most of it. And it's the same country that elected Barack Obama that elects Trump, right, four years later. Like, Trump, Obama's re-elected in 2012. So it is the same history, no matter which way you c cut it. But I think what people did, who were trying, who read the book trying to understand Trump, was just stuff jumped out at them more. Like, it w you know, when uh, John C. Calhoun says this is a white man's count country founded by white men for their posterity forever. I think readers who were trying to reckon with the resurgence of white nationalism were like, oh, this, that was in the 1830s, I see it here. Or like stuff just kind of leapt out to them in like yellow highlighting or something. Whereas they maybe wouldn't have noticed that the same way. Like it's just a kind of Rorschach test, mm -hmm. I think, for the, for the reader. Because you could read it, it is the same history. There's always that stuff throughout American history. Yeah. Were you personally su surprised by Trump's election? Did Trump also just happen for you? Uh, I was less surprised than, as I have a whole bunch of friends that I walk mm -hmm. with with the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> with our dogs. And uh, you know, I, I would always be the one saying, I think he might win. But, and they, they would be like, no, that's never gonna happen. So I don't, wouldn't say like, I saw it coming, because mm -hmm. I didn't. But I was, I think, slightly less deluded than other people, okay. maybe. Yeah. Hindsight of a story and the power yeah. of the history. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the final form of identity we want to talk about is identity politics. And this is something that is in news and opinion pieces quite a lot right now. But the, the term is used so much that it's kind of a buzzword. So we were wondering, how do you define identity politics? I mean, I think of it as um, in a continuum with there's party politics. So when the United States were founded, there, there were no party. Like, the founders were not anticipating that there would be parties. Mm -hmm. Our system of government does not allow for parties. By the 1790s, there were parties. And so much of American history was really driven by party politics. Mm -hmm. And then um, when you get into the 20th century, there's a lot of um, in interest group politics, right, where um, interest groups like, for instance, the NRA or, you know, mm -hmm. American businessmen or um, the farmers' lobby, right? So a lot of politics rearranges itself or unions rearranges itself around interest groups. So I think of identity politics in that um, sequence from party politics to interest group politics to identity politics, um, where politics is organized around how individual citizens identify themselves, what, they, what, what, af what affiliation they subscribe to or believe is the most important affiliation in their lives. Um, that would be one way that mm -hmm. I think about it. Another way I think about identity politics is that um, much of American history has involved a struggle and not by no means always a successful struggle, but always a struggle in the interest of equality. Um, and in many ways, within the realm of identity politics, there's actually quite little discussion of equality since a lot of the discussion is about identity, mm -hmm. which I think is quite destabilizing. Could you um, give an example of this in history? An example of that in history? Um, like how identity politics works, destabilizing instead of working towards yeah. equality? Well, I think... I, to, be, to, to, to be clear, identity politics has been there all along, in the same way that we still have interest yeah. group politics and we still have party group politics. Um, identity politics 
actually in American history has largely been white identity politics. Mm -hmm. So, you know, John C. Calhoun in the 1830s talking about the country as a white man's country, therefore we shouldn't annex Mexico because we can't make Mexicans citizens because they're not white, according to Calhoun. Like, that's identity politics, right? It's also white nationalism. Um, that's been a, a, a form of identity politics that has been a continuous form in American history. That is always in tension with the idea of equality, right? Okay. Um, I don't think it's less, less so today. We think of and, and should rightly celebrate the many ways, the many forms of emancipa emancipation that we can associate with identity politics, like what the emergence of the gay pride, gay rights, and then the, you know, m later the marriage equality movements mean by way of uh, achieving constitutional reform. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's an identity politics movement. Uh, the, whole, the entirety of the LGBTQ movement emerges from a politics of identity. Um, but where it has been in stabilizing has actually been in constitutional reform in the interest of equality. Uh, so, you know, it can, it, it is, bo it is, can be both things, right? Like it has this, I think, quite complicated history uh, and, it, and it can go in multiple directions. Okay. What would you say, uh, I mean, you make your dissatisfaction with identity politics quite clear, also in your written work. For you, what is the biggest problem created by identity politics? Is it this? Is it this, this discrepancy that you describe? Um, I, I mean, I'm not like one of these sort of vehement like anti-identity politics yeah. crusaders or where something. Where would you, where would you, where would you I fall I on the but spectrum? But I do think it can be, I think it can, uh, It can stifle political debate. Okay. If um, you and I are arguing about something, but you tell me that I can't speak about that because of my identity, mm -hmm. then there's a whole, like let's say I was Jewish and you told me that. She's uh, Jewish actually, <laughs> so that's <laughs> we can use that example. Well, you know, that, that and you <laughs> told me that, it, you know, that I didn't have a right to speak about this matter okay. having to do with Christianity because I was a Jew and I could never mm -hmm. possibly understand. And if we were arguing about religion, I s maybe that's where we end up, but if we're arguing about a, a liberal political community that we both participate in, we have to find a way to talk across difference. So it's more the limitation on the freedom of speech. That I don't know that it's freedom of, it's, it's, it's actually a, a, a capacity to belong together in a okay. political community. So we, I, people are different. People have different identities. People should celebrate their, different, their mm -hmm. differentness. But liberalism does actually require us to think about how we can exist together in a political community. So there's nothing wrong with identity politics so long as it is consistent with that idea if you believe in liberal, and I do kind of believe in the liberal nation state. So it's not necessarily a problem, I but, it, but it can be a problem. Okay. And have you seen any developments or effects of identity politics in on your campus as a professor? <sighs> I'm on sabbatical, that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> but in your previous past, maybe. Um, mm. Yeah, sure, I don't, you know, not mm. in some bad way. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Well, then we can also yeah. ask another question. A more positive way. Shall we move to yeah, I think, I mean, one of the ways that I think maybe identity politics has worked in negative and um, in a negative way uh, for the field that you are you know active in history is that people often misuse history mm -hmm. and you already mentioned this or we, t we touched briefly upon this with uh, the second amendment but could you maybe give another example of where history has been misused to further a certain political agenda um i was really struck as I covered the Tea Party movement mm -hmm. for a magazine that I write for, and I spent a lot of time with people who were passionate about that movement, um, and they were very passionate that they were, they were deeply opposed to national health care, that they thought it was socialism. The next thing you know would be like living in Europe. Like this was their... <laughs> 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 the worst. This worst. was the worst <laughs> possible thing. <laughs> but they... Um, and again, like that's a political view. I disagree with it, and mm -hmm. I, you know, as a citizen, but what really just shocked me was people would say, I can remember I was once at a rally with a woman who was a nurse and um, she was carrying a sign, you know, with George Washington or whatever. 
And I said, you know, tell me about your sign. Like, what is it about the 18th century that so draws you in? And she says, well, I know that, you know, these people, all these great men would be rolling over in their graves if they thought that this country had come to this, that we were requiring people to have national, to ha you know, to have health insurance. And I, I, I was really, she's like, I would love to go back and live in that time when people were really free. And she was a nurse, and I was like, you know, you would have, like, we would have all died yeah. in childhood. <laughs> Do you know what people I mean? Like, really our, yeah, our babies would have all died in our yeah. arms when they were two days old. Like, we'd have smallpox scars on our face if we had <laughs> lived through uh, to adulthood. Like, we die of malaria. Like, what about the 18th century it's so appealing. speaks to yeah. you as appealing? And it wasn't, I'm just saying she was, she was a lovely person. She was a very smart person. She just never asked, been asked to think about history. She'd mm -hmm. been, you know, watching a lot of television where it was pointed out to her every day, every day, every day that George Washington, you know, lived and died so that you would not have to have national health insurance. And <laughs> I, what is that? Do you you think know, that drives me nuts. Do you think that this, I guess you could call it public history. Do you think that this can legitimize or delegitimize, sorry, the, the science or the subject that is history? Yes, uh, it absolutely, and it has, and I think it's tricky because the way to oppose that is not to go out and say, history tells us that <laughs> we should have national health insurance, right? That's just as bad. Like, history yeah. doesn't tell us that. So I, as a citizen, we think we should have national health insurance, because yeah. I think we should have it. There are constitutional obstacles. We can debate those, but uh, the answer is not for historians to go charging the barricades mm -hmm. from the other side because they happen to have different political views, because that's what undermines any sense that it's a discipline where there are methods and there's evidence and there are arguments. Uh, so I, I think it's a tricky thing to, to encounter. But I think one thing that's difficult is, like if you think of uh, astronomy, right, is a science involving physics. But astrology is like a kooky, fun, <laughs> thing that you do when you read the new, like oh, you read your good zodiac thing, good thing the next question is not what is your zodiac sign but like <laughs> but like we understand those two things are different yeah. like we might enjoy astrology but we understand that astronomy is a is a field of study right or chemistry we understand there's a body of knowledge and there are methods and there's the periodic table and you do experiments alchemy is bananas <laughs> like alchemy is goofy like alchemy is y you know whatever like you might mm. want to know about alchemy, but you wouldn't confuse it with chemistry. And why is this line so blurred when it comes uh, to the so subject for of history? For history, we call the two things the same thing. Like the history that you study in your classroom where you're looking at evidence and questioning it and looking at arguments and engaging in an argument, that we call history. But all this other stuff of like, George Washington doesn't ever want you to have health care, we also call that history. We mm -hmm. don't have another word for it. What, what, would you give a word for it? Or I think it's folklore. Okay, folklore. Uh, I don't think it, it's not like some toxic thing. Like, everyone has folklore. Like, that's <laughs> fine. Like, you can have stories that you tell and traditions or whatever, but we, we shouldn't confuse it with humanistic inquiry. Yeah. So we talked a bit, of, or not even a bit, extensively, <laughs> I would say, about polarization in America. And of course, this is not the first time in American history that we see polarization and division. So we were wondering, have we moved away from polarization before, and can we learn from how we've moved away from polarization before. So I think that all the measures of polarization suffer from a grave error, which, which is, is uh, if you think about, so slavery didn't end until really the 18th, 1860s. Then it was followed by a period of race-based segregation. And it's not until 1964, 1965, with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act that you could even argue that African Americans have political equality in the United States, right? So you have all of American history down to 1965 mm -hmm. where you have a completely disenfranchised, almost entirely disenfranchised population that is not counted in how we measure polarization. In other words, there's no day before 1965 uh, that is that is not deeply polarized, so long as you understand African Americans as political actors. Like, even in, in, under the institution of slavery, enslaved people have a politics. Their politics is, we want freedom, this is unfair. <laughs> and they don't count as a political party, because they aren't even considered persons under the law. 
But that is a deeply polarized political community. So, so long as we understand, you know, or, or think of indigenous peoples whose interests are not necessarily even in belonging to the nation, but in fact in seceding from whatever, you know, forms of imperialism being exerted over them, if you understand all of these peoples who are in the United States as political actors, not just the people who are enfranchised, before 1920, women can't vote. Like, if you think of everybody, then politics is deeply polarized. It's polarized mm -hmm. by virtue of the disenfranchisement of more than half the population, right? So when we think about polarization, in, in American history, it actually really only begins, this, this our current regime of polarization, around 1965. Um, and polarization has been rising ever since. That is actually about finally counting everybody in a way, less than it is about like now Americans are really divided. It's like, no, it's now everybody actually is allowed to be part of the political community under our you know, rule of laws. And so it's messy and it's hard. And, and there are a lot of people trying to make it harder and making money off of make it, making it harder. Um, I just think that correction is really important because yeah. otherwise it looks like, oh, America's really harmonious and then suddenly polarization is <laughs> like, no, actually everybody's excluded from the political community until suddenly like most people are included and now it turns out noticing. people it's really disagree. Yeah. Okay, I think that this is again a nice point to move to the audience. Are there any audience questions at this point? There's one over there. Thanks for coming here. So I have a question about your idea of civic uh, patriotism or uh, liberal nationalism. So in Europe, maybe in the US, I'm, I'm not that into the US political life, uh, but we see that different right-wing leaders, right-wing parties like Marine Le Pen, Thierry Baudot here, and other, other guys like in Hungary and Poland, they say that Actually, what we are doing is coming back to the original liberal values of Jean-Jacques Rousseau and, and yeah, other philosophers. What do you think? Can this idea of civic patriotism can actually be a bit dangerous to us nowadays? And yeah, how, how would you comment on it? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I, I do think it's a s slippery situation. Um, it is the case that... Uh, Illiberal nationalists always make historical arguments, right? There, uh, it's always a call to a race-based common ancestry. That's you know that's that's what illiberal nationalism is. Like we are actually we are one people because we have the same ancestry, and everybody else around us doesn't belong here. And the way for us to have political stability is to exclude everyone else, right? even though the last 200 years of European and American history has actually been about making sure to include everyone. Um, not consistently, because <laughs> there are obviously <laughs> huge exceptions. Um, so traditionally, liberals don't pay attention to the past, and their arguments are based always on looking ahead to the future. Uh, and then conservatives and, and, and illiberal from nationalists look backward. That's what, like, a, to be a conservative is to look backward to tradition, right? Mm -hmm. And to be a, a certain kind of nationalist is to look to a racial history. Um, I'm just trying to suggest that there is actually, in the American story, uh, an incredibly powerful tradition of liberal nationalism, of liberal thinkers who have said, do you know what? This nation is flawed. It's really flawed. <laughs> it's been flawed from the start. We're engaging in all kinds of uh, questionable decisions every day. And yet, here is an idea that counts. And here is a constitution that guarantees rights. And here are the methods that we use uh, to extend rights. And here is a tradition that says, you are allowed to disagree with this tradition. And that's the only way forward, in my view. Uh, but it does actually require not abdicating the past, but in fact confronting it and being and confronting a history of genocide and confronting a history of enslavement and conquest. In the United States, we don't actually have much of a sense of confronting our own past, right? That Europeans do. Ha you have a sense of confronting atrocity 
in the recent past of this country. Like we, we're not too far from the Anne Frank Museum. Like you guys, there is a there is a tr there's at least a culture around confronting atrocity, reckoning with it, and trying to figure out uh, how to steer steer a ship forward. That doesn't that hasn't existed in the United States. Uh, intermittently, it has for sure. I mean, there have there have been arguments about that all along. Uh, but I think I do actually think that's an essential part of belonging to a nation. Kay. Are there any more audience questions? See one over there. Uh, hello. Uh, since uh, you talked about um, liberal nationalism and um, uh, that uh, thing. Uh, in the Netherlands at the moment, in Europe, we have to decide or uh, uh, there is uh, uh, going to be decided about trade uh, associations like TTIP with the United States or CETA or uh, now with uh, Brazil, uh, among others, uh, the Mercosur uh, Association. Uh, how do these kind of uh, trade uh, agreements have place in a liberal uh, 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 nation? since they, uh, according to our uh, historian uh, 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 prime minister, are liberal, uh, uh, but they also undermine the liberty of nations to do things about uh, animal rights or uh, uh, environmental uh, policy or uh, uh, workers' rights. Mm -hmm. I don't know enough about the policy implications of the trade agreements that the Netherlands is considering to give you any kind of <laughs> view on that and shouldn't speak on something I don't know about. In the general, I recognize the general question. I mean, historically, when nations kind of pull up their drawbridges uh, and say, we're going to stop the flow of goods and people across our borders, uh, that has led to war, not to greater um, prosperity for the nations that are pulling up their drawbridges. So there's a real caution there. I mean, obviously, the in, in the United States, we are in the midst of engaging with trade wars of all kinds as the Trump administration pursues its own policy of pulling up the nation's drawbridges. Um, it's been destabilizing both domestically and abroad. Uh, the, the case in the U.S. that raises questions about rights issues, like should you trade, in terms of like trade with China, say. That's not, in, in, in the case of the United States, it's not the Trump administration has a problem with China and human rights. That's not why <laughs> we're having a trade war with China, right? It actually is, is just a Trump trade war. It has nothing to do with rights. So I guess I would wonder whether sometimes the, those claims about rights are a, a political cover for other agendas. But I don't know actually enough about your, what's going on here. Okay, so we just touched upon already a bit in, in that you said that America does not have a, a culture yet of grappling with its past. And we were wondering what kind of culture would you propose or do you see happening in other countries that would be good for America to, to grapple with its past and to teach and learn history in an objective way? Yeah, I mean, there are... There there have been lots of efforts, but in so a, a good example would be um, at the nation's 200th anniversary, so 1776 mm -hmm. is the nation's founding with mm -hmm. the Declaration of Independence. So in the lead up to 1976, there were all these official government celebrations of the bicentennial of the country. And they were most of them planned by the Nixon administration. And they were so controversial because of how they ignored the story of slavery and the story of native peoples and had no room for women that there was so there was a presidential bicentennial commission and then there emerged a people's bicentennial commission which was essentially a marxist organization <laughs> and then there were a series of other bicentennial commissions, one for each group that was left out of the official presidential commemoration. And then what happened at the bicentennial is that there was just like a big cultural battle between people who wanted to remember the country as if America had never done anything wrong and people who wanted to remember the country only for the wrongs that America had done. And these two positions map very well onto the political yeah. parties and their 
commitments at the extremes. And um, I guess I think both of those positions are really dangerous and volatile. That is to say, to, to, in, in our country, there's no sort of middle position of like, okay, there's all, this, there's all these horrible things that have been done, and we need to reckon with them. But also, the country's done some kind of great things, and there's an incredible tradition to celebrate. There's no middle ground like that. Um, also not like average history textbooks. Average history textbooks are either one or the okay. other. It depends on what state you live in. If, you know, our state, we call our states red and blue based on their yeah. political values, mm -hmm. and our elementary school textbooks are chosen by state politi politicians, and they choose, you know, either this story or this story. And like I, when I meet college students who come to my classroom, I can tell what state they grew up in based on what version of American history they have. And that, it's like having de like a denialism as a legitimate history and then a kind of fetishization of atrocity as a yeah. legitimate history. And there's no middle ground. Middle ground. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I totally understand why that happened. Um, I just think then you have a segregated past, right? Like I went to, we have a new museum, relatively new museum in Washington, the Smithsonian Museum of African American History. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible yeah. museum. And I went there with my kids and it was incredible. And then we went down the street to the Museum of American History and almost everybody in the Museum of African American History was black or brown. And almost everybody in the Museum of American History was white. It so was that's like also very segregated. It's just, it's like they're yeah. both good museums, th this, you know, but they kind you kind of need to have to have a you need both but you also need them to come together some in some places and um, this isn't even a criticism of these two museums it's more just like this is how our country's history works and I, I think it's a problem yeah. I think unfortunately we're running out of time so our final question to you is that you once said that history can save the world and neither can it save democracy so what can history do? I said that? You wrote yeah, that you in You wrote that in the... <laughs> What's the title? Of public the seminar. <laughs> yeah, it was the title of the, of the piece as well. Uh, okay. Um. Maybe the <laughs> editor just thought to give it a spicy name, so yeah, it would attract a yeah. lot of... Uh, um, I, I, th I think you don't just don't have bearings going forward without history. I mean, imagine, you know, you were in a relationship you know, with your parents or, you know, a boyfriend or a girlfriend or your spouse or a child. And, like, it's Tuesday and you start fresh because it's Tuesday and you have no past with that person. How do you even go forward? And, like, you understand your relationship with your sister because of the history that you have with your sister. I mean, you don't have to constantly be re-examining your history together. Yeah. That's exhausting. But you actually don't want to start, like... Well, it's Wednesday. I don't know what happened <laughs> since. All I really know is what happened since this morning. Like the sense that we just are constantly erasing what's behind us as peoples is, I think, um, it's just it's it's it leads to a kind of bafflement. I think people are kind of baffled. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And I actually want to mention before we give uh, our professor Lepore our awesome guest a warm round of applause. I want to mention that if you like this interview, we actually have a podcast, a YouTube channel, a Facebook, and an Instagram, not Snapchat. So please make sure to check that out. Mm -hmm. And yeah, for now, a warm round of applause. Yeah. For Hope you enjoyed the interview. Thank you, guys. <laughs> that was great. Thank you so much.